All right, we're just a short little break there. Um, stay on time. We're going to move things towards Brian. Um, Brian, I'm going to go ahead and give you control of the screen. You should be able to uh, pull up your screen there, Brian. And uh, you now have um, voice capability too. Um, I want to thank everybody for, for joining us here for our, uh, um, our um, second international webinar conference. Um, this is our last session. Um, thank you for all of you who have um, hung in there through, the, through this, uh, this long webinar. Uh, we hope you really enjoyed this, um, this format. Um, our last session here is Brian Whipker from North Carolina State University. Third time's a charm today, Brian. Um, so he's going to be talking about managing pH drift, um, recognizing and correcting high and low pH disorders. Okay. Thanks, Brian. So third time's a charm. That means there's no, not going to be any computer glitches this time. So we'll be good to go. So, so, um, so I'm looking at uh, talking about some some of the details about pH drift. Specifically, John Gato suggested this topic because he's gotten a lot of calls at Proven Winners that there's still some problems that are going on. It would be a good review. So what we're going to do today is look at those optimal ranges. Then we're going to look at the symptoms of both high and low pH symptoms. We're going to look at the factors that influence the pH drift, the monitoring procedures, and then finally the corrective procedures. So to start off with, what are the optimal ranges for pH? And so for most plants, they fall within 5.5 and 6.5, but there are some exceptions. And those exceptions come down to plants that have particular problems that may occur if the pH gets one way or the other, and that is petunias. We want to keep the pH like slightly lower because if it gets too high, we start seeing that iron deficiency symptom occurring. On the opposite end of the spectrum, geraniums want the pH higher because if the pH goes too low, we get lower leaf symptomology, which I'll show you in a few minutes. And then we have kind of the general crops. And I guess what I want to really say to those that I, I guess my opinion now is they just don't show symptoms. If it gets too hot or too cold on them or too low or too high, whatever, um, they, they might slow down on growth is what occurs, but you don't see the symptomology. And so that's why we fine tune the pH ranges is whether or not they're showing symptoms of being too high a pH or too low of a pH. So this is a table that you're going to see probably more of. Brian Krug and I are working on a, on a pour through app along with uh, uh, Dr. Owen at Virginia Tech and Sarah White down at Clemson. And so these are some of the, the ranges for pH that we're looking at and also for EC. And so we'll, we'll be developing this table over the next few months of getting optimal ranges that we're looking at and trying to categorize plants as far as which niche they work the best on. So when things are not looking right, what do they look like? So so first of all, let's look at high substrate pH problems. Now, you can go based on where the symptoms occur to help you diagnose these two problems. High pH problems, iron deficiency, occurs in the upper, the new foliage, whereas if the pH is too low, when you get iron and manganese toxicity symptoms, those symptoms develop on the lower foliage. So that location will help you diagnose between those two problems. I showed this slide earlier in, in the problem shot, uh, the problem presentation at the beginning. Intervenal chlorosis of the upper foliage, we see here at a dragon wing, that denotes that the pH is too high. Here's a really severe case on a scented geranium, and you can see the classical intervenal chlorosis. The veins are green, the rest is yellow, and so it's a really uh, uh, pronounced uh, effect when the pH gets too high for too long on some of these plants. The same progression goes on that you know you see the initial yellowing between the veins more severe in the middle when it's a moderate, and then it will bleach out uh, when it's extremely high. And here's the case of a calabacoa, and that has been grown too long at a high pH. You can see how it's white, 
and and there are a few brown spots on there because of sunburn occurring on that plant. So again, upper uh, uh, foliage uh, discoloration occurring with the uh, the pH being too high. So generally we think that the problems occur because the substrate's too high and yes you need to end up checking that to test to make sure it's there but just be forewarned that other problems that uh, that affect the roots that inhibit the root uptake of those elements such as root rot, cold growing, or waterlogged soils can also end up uh, manifesting itself as far as symptoms of iron deficiency. So you need to go back and look to see what's happening. Now we, we have a new handout. It will be introduced next week with the, uh, the eGrow Alert 4.02. It is up on the website, but I, I checked before getting back on here. The website server is still down uh, uh, with the provider, and so uh, you'll get that if you're if you're a subscriber to eGrow Alert, you'll get the notification next week. Otherwise, visit our website a little later and you can pull, pull down 4.02 that has some of these ranges that are optimal for most plants. So on the opposite end of the spectrum, what do symptoms look like if the pH is too low? And there are three main symptoms that I want to point out that you're looking at. The classical bronzing that occurs here, the good plant on the left, the, the yellowing, the bronzing occurring on the plant on the right. The pH is too low. You're starting to look at a pH value in most crops below 5.5 or 5.2 when you really start seeing problems occurring. Likewise, on a marigold, this almost looks like, um, you, you would also think, because it's, it's lower foliage, that it might be a magnesium deficiency. So a quick uh, substrate test will tell you the pH is very low. Again, in the 5-4 neighborhood, 5-2, you'll start seeing symptomology occurring. And here's the progression from not very uh, severely affected on the, uh, on the left, to necrosis occurring all the way on the right with the severity of an iron manganese toxicity on marigolds. Nasturtiums, more of a black spotting, kind of it, it's gone from a from a russeting uh, uh, effect to a spotting effect that's occurring is another symptom that we're looking at. You can also see it on the lower foliage of this Gerbera. It's more of a purplish black spotting. See those lower leaves, especially with the one that's kind of yellow. And here's a highlight. You can see that spotting that's occurring. You can also have some yellowing happen. We see that more often in the southeast where we have pure water, but we've had problems occur, and I've gotten reports from like uh, Illinois, for instance. So even areas with high alkaline water or alkalinity in their water can run into problems. So it's the black spotting that occurs. The same thing occurs on a zinnia. And then here is a case we ran into this past spring, and it was on an eGrow Alert 329, Streptocarpus. There were two cultivars there, in that greenhouse and when I first saw it I thought because it's so purple that it was a phosphorus deficiency problem but then when I got over to the other the second cultivar it went one was really red and then it had a little more black and I said I, I think I know what this is it's low pH and sure enough it was at pH 4.5 well I would probably guess that you start getting below about a pH 5.1 that's when you're going to start seeing the problem. I, uh, this is just the value that we got on this particular plant, and you can see it's severely affected. So it might be even on more of a reddening color versus a blackish coloration when the pH is too low. Uh, we had some experiments. This is more reddening also occurring on ageratium. Uh, ageratum, pH 5.1, that, that the situation occurring. And then earlier I showed the dragon wing begonias. Again, lower leaves, that bronzing, blackening occurring because of toxicity. A, a test of the tissue, of the symptomatic tissue, you can see the values are higher. That's another confirmation that you could end up using. Now, a point to make here is that we typically tell people to target the most recently mature leaves when you're trying to do a tissue sample. But to capture that accumulation of iron and manganese, you probably want to consider doing a second tissue test or just doing the one that's the lower leaves with symptoms on it, and you will then capture that, yes, in fact, those, those elements of 
iron and manganese are elevated, and that will help you confirm the diagnosis as far as the problem is concerned. Also showed this a little earlier. If you get too low on the pH, you will get only stunted growth. Some plants do not manifest those symptoms on that plant, and you can see that the difference between the, the higher pH versus growing it at 3.3, the plants are 59% smaller. Even just going down to a pH 4.8, the plants are 29% smaller. We saw the same thing on poinsettias. Again, this was considered a general crop, but we do see iron deficiency if it gets too high, but we don't see iron and manganese toxicity when it gets too low. We only see the stunted growth. And in fact, with that plant that was grown at two, pH 2.9, when I did the tissue sample on that plant, the values were within this acceptable range. And so what we really might want to say is it's not an accumulator of iron and manganese. And that accumulation is what manifests itself as far as those tissue values uh, or those tiss that tissue necrosis going on with that plant. So then what affects uh, the uh, uh, substrate drift uh, as far as the pH is concerned. So here's a table that looks at the main components. Now I'm, I'm only going to briefly look at this, but of course, if you know it's the factor on the left, the middles, if it goes, it drifts to a higher pH versus a low pH. So components, if it's core, core is more basic, so it can make the you know, over time you might see the pH go up versus peat and bark are acidic, so we add lime. And so then when you add limestone, if you add too much limestone or it's too uh, uh, fine and it reacts quicker, you might see it increase, whereas if you don't have enough lime, lime it can decrease. Water alkalinity, if you really start getting above about 200 part per million bicarbonate, you're really going to start seeing the pH of that substrate go up if you don't inject acid. On the opposite end, in, in, in the south, many places where we don't have limestone bedrock, we have little or no alkalinity. So we have nothing there to basically give you insurance policy. There's no resistance to change because we don't have enough bicarbonate in the water supply. And then we're looking at fertilizer type. A basic fertilizer will help increase the pH. An acidic uh, fertilizer will cause the pH to go down, and there can be an, a species effect for both high and low drifting. So what do I mean uh, specifically about the, P, uh, the species effect? Some work that Dr. Nelson did with the graduate student planting seeds looked at how pH changed with those plants. Some plants like vinca and, and zinnia cause the pH to go up. But you know, both Finca and Xenia don't like pHs to be very high. They get iron chlorosis. Some cause the pH to go down. Specifically, Celosia and tomatoes don't like the pH being low. They'll have iron mang and manganese toxicity occurring on those plants. So plants don't always do what they should be doing, so they can kind of work against you. So you need to keep that in mind when you're growing the plants. When you look at pH values over time, there are some, some general trends that generally occur. So the lime charge generally gets the pH up to where it needs to be because it's been designed that way. But if the substrate's held for a long time, you might see that effect diminishing over time and the pH start going back down. We do sometimes see that in North Carolina. We also see that when, when the lime charge gets lower, because we don't have magnesium in the water supply, we get a lot of magnesium deficiencies late in the season on some spring crops because it's, it's running out of the, the lime charge. So lime charge initially increases, then over time it can decrease. Alkaline water, alkalinity, it will cause the pH to go up in that substrate if you don't neutralize it. So over time, you can have an upward trend that's going on. As far as uptake effect, when you're looking at fertilizers, an acidic fertilizer that's typically high in urea, high in uh, ammoniacal nitrogen, over time will cause the pH to go down whereas nitrate fertilizers will cause the pH to go up. The reason for that when you have a root and you're fertilizing it, in this case with a basic fertilizer like NO3, the root wants to remain in balance. So if it takes up a negative charge, it's got to give one out. And so that uptake then, because you have that OH being released, causes 
an upward shift of that pH and that substrate. On the opposite end of the spectrum, if you're looking at fertile, acidic fertilizers and you have that root and you have the uptake of the positive charge, a positive is going to be given off, more hydrogen in there will cause a shift of the pH going down. So that's what we're seeing as far as the uptake effect by those plants and you can regulate some of the growth that's going on and where the pH is to affect some of that growth. So that is the basic line of the story and that's what we really have been talking about for the last 10 years. But actually it's not the rest of the story. So this occurs when the fertilizer supplied equals the fertilizer demand. So you have that in balance. You have an uptake effect as being the overall parameter that's going on and affecting that substrate pH. But some work that Dr. Nelson directed with uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Zhang looked at the effects of both uh, substrate pH and EC on what occurs with the substrate uh, over time. And so when you're going with a low amount of fertility, such as 100 part per million, and in this case it was pretty well the amount of fertilizer supplied equaled the amount the plant needed. And how do we know that? When you, when you measure the EC, it, it pretty well stayed the same. And it doesn't matter if the blue line's being basic, a basic fertilizer, they had a neutral fertilizer, which is denoted by green, or an acidic fertilizer, which is denoted by red. Overall, when it's in balance, you'll see that EC level staying pretty well the same. What happened to the pH over time? Well, in this case, like we just said in that illustration, if it takes up a, a negative, it gives a negative off. So the basic fertilizer caused the pH to go up, neutral pretty well stayed the same, and acidic fertilizer caused the pH to go down. That's what we say is going to happen. But what they also found that if you increase the fertilizer rate, in the case they used 200 part per million, and the supply was greater than demand, what occurred? Well, the ECs went up, but you expect that because you're giving too much to the plant, and that's how you can measure if you're running into a problem. But then what happened to the pH? All of them decreased. Why is that the case? It's, it's contrary to what we've been saying on uptake. And so the reason for that is if you look at the chemical effect of that fertilizer when you're mixing it, if you got an acidic fertilizer and you got a basic fertilizer and you have two containers, what's the solution pH? Well, we did this and you know you mix it up and and roughly a solution pH for 2010-20 is going to be like 3.8. It's going to vary a little bit. It's, it's acidic. It's like Coca-Cola or, or uh, Sprite if you measure the pH. How about if it's a basic fertilizer? You think because it's basic it would be higher but in fact, it's lower, it is more acidic. So consequently, if you're adding too much fertilizer to that plant, it causes the, the, the chemical effect is greater than the uptake effect and the pH starts tumbling downward. And so, uh, so the summary is if, it's, if the supply of fertilizer equals the demand, uptake effect is greater than the chemical effect. And so you would expect then the fertilizer type Acidic ones would cause the pH to go down and basic ones causing it to go up. But if you have the supply greater than the demand, the chemical effect of that fertilizer is greater than the uptake effect. And consequently, in all cases, no matter which fertilizer it is, the pH will decrease. Now, basic fertilizers won't decrease quite as much as an acidic one, but they will all go down and you start having that drift downward and you see pH problems occurring in the plant. So the key here is to match the EC level that you're supplying with the demand of the plant and then monitor those EC values to make sure they're pretty well stable to help overcome the problem that's going on. So how do you determine the substrate pH? You know, one to two dilution, SME uh, testing that most labs do, or the pour through. Uh, you know, in-house it's one to two or pour through works very well. Uh, a lot of the recommendations from proven winners based on the one to two dilution, but, but basically pH values are the same no matter what, what test procedure you use. The difference comes in on the EC values. 
in, uh, uh, on those plants. So you can do the testing. You know, we do a lot of pour through monitoring so we don't destroy the roots. You irrigate the plant in photo one, you let it sit for an hour, put a saucer underneath, give it enough water to get about 50 mils out of the bottom, collect the leachate, and then test it for pH and EC and, and look at the trends. And if it's more of a, of a cell pack, you can use a, use a whole cell pack to get out what you want to get enough of a sample for testing. So then how do you evaluate these, these different values and make corrective procedures? Use those values you see there, the ranges we're providing, or in the table that's now in that eGrow Alert 4.02, we basically, if you got a wide enough range, you look at the target range, really the widest range, we come in two tenths on either side from the top to come into a middle zone that you're, you're gonna target. And then if it gets in the yellow zone, that's the last two tenths on the outside wings, that's when you know you're gonna make some management changes that's going on to avoid it going into the red. So you get green zones, yellow zones for all three different types of plants. Then plotting that over time, doing your values. If it's going well, you're fine. If it goes down into the, the target, the yellow zone, you make a change to turn things around so the pH ends up going back up and you don't have a problem with that plant. So the corrective procedures, they're, they're, I, I'm not providing those of saying mix this with that because we have it in a table in 305 from last year and then 402 that's coming out next week that you can, if you have a problem, you can download this, this uh, PDF. It's now 19 pages because I think there's 10 pages of pH ranges that we're providing with this handout. So in conclusions, you need to know what symptoms look like of high and low pH. You need to know what factors cause the pH to drift out of the range that you want. By the most part, make sure in the case here that people aren't aware, make sure the EC is within the range that it needs to be. Too high a level will cause a drop. Usually to get a low pH tumble, it's a, it's a, a acidic conditions and another stress, drought stress, high light, that also makes the plant start going down downhill on pH and these C, our pH values. Monitor it and then if you have a problem, those two alerts are there that you could use to, to come back through and make your corrective procedures. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. Okay, Brian, the, uh, the first question that we have is <clears throat> um, referring to the lime charge. Is there any advantages to having half of the charge of the lime incorporated instead of the full charge for petunias? Um, so the low charge. Now, some people are, a, a lot of the soil companies are going for a lower dose. And so that that is a common practice and you can use that. So it, it's being used. Uh, where I see the biggest hassle that comes in then that people forget that this batch was the, the low lime and then they put their geraniums in it. So you just have to do the management on that to make sure it's there. But some people will start lower. I wouldn't start any lower than probably about 5.4 uh, on a pH. Does anybody else have any other questions for Brian um, while we have him on the line? We've got a couple of minutes available here for, for some questions. Well, I, actually, I just saw who, who put that email in. I mean, the, the other comment is that it, you can, you know, if you're running into pH problems and you ha you're in an area of high alkalinity in your irrigation water, the other option, well, for more, more of a geranium is to uh, um, uh, add, add less acid to keep the pH up for a geranium, whereas for a petunia, you could, you could indirectly add a little more acid in the system if you could only separate the petunias out and bring that pH down will also be an, another alternative, but that's a little tougher to do. All right, uh, anybody else have any other questions for Brian? All right. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank you for, uh, you know, giving us the hat trick today and, and giving three different talks throughout the day. Um, and uh, thank to, thanks to all of you who have um, participated in this in this uh, second annual International eGrow webinar conference. 
Um, it's great to be able to offer this to everybody. Um, and we couldn't offer it to everybody like this without our sponsorship by Proven Winners. So a big thank you to Proven Winners um, for their help um, bringing this, this webinar to all of you.